To solve this mystery, Nicola Barbatelli decides to call on experts in facial recognition analysis. Several studies are launched. One takes place in Spain, in association with Christian Galvez. This Spanish researcher is the author of a study on the evolution of pictorial representations of Leonardo's face. I've been in touch with the group who are specialized in morphopsychology of the Civil Guard, the UCO. They are facial recognition experts. They decided to apply the morphology ability towards art, and in this precise case, to the Tavla Lucana, to Melzi's portrait, and the alleged self-portrait from Torino. The faces are analyzed and compared to determine if there's morphological compatibility between the different portraits. In parallel, the faces are compared using dimensional parameters, such as the length of the nose, or the distance between the top of the nose and the chin. These two experiments came to the same conclusion. There is great morphological similarity between the face of the Lucan portrait and Melzi's drawing. The man in the Windsor profile portrait and the one in the Lucan portrait are the same person. The only one that does not coincide with these images is the alleged self-portrait from Torino. This result implies that the two portraits were done using direct facial measurements. We know that Leonardo da Vinci measured what he painted with a gauge. He was incredibly precise with his measurements. In fact, he was concerned to find the proportions of the human body and the human face. He made drawings of many, many faces where he would break the features up. He would square them off and figure out the proportion. What are the relations of the forehead to the length of the nose? What's the relation of the width of the mouth to the length of the chin? Several texts and drawings found in the codexes show his systematic studies of the human face. From the eyebrow to the junction of the lips and the chin, and from there to the angle of the jaw, and from there to the upper end of the ear near the temple, a perfect square is formed. One side measures half of the head. The faces represented on both the Lucan painting and Melzi's sketch look strangely similar. But how can one be sure that it is one and the same face. At Tallinn University, a 3D reconstruction experiment could provide proof. Orest Kormashov, director of the art history department. Helen Koch, a 3D designer. And Gianni Glini, consultant for the Lucan Museum, partner for this unprecedented research. The comparison of Melzi's profile and the three-quarter Lucan portrait enabled us to identify the specific points between the two works which perfectly coincide and to create a 3D reconstruction of Leonardo's face. Really consists out of triangles, right? So you have to use these triangles. And uh, how you start building is that you have to have as many different angles from the face as possible. So in our case, it was this like some kind of angle plus the uh, side face. And you just put these in the 3D program and you start to build the face in between. In addition to the 3D reconstruction on the computer, Orest Kormashov tackled the modeling of Leonardo's face. It was uh, 
Uh, the idea to use uh, different approaches, first the classical one uh, that was uh, in the form of sculpture and the other was using the latest uh, uh, digital uh, possibilities, uh, both absolutely different ways and we were, were very curious if we uh, come to the similar result. I realized this uh, plastic model in a very uh, traditional way. First I modeled it from clay because it's very plastical, it's very easy to, uh, to work with and so uh, uh, this was something that, uh, that was uh, um, the most, uh, of course, challenging. A few days later, Gianni Glini came back to the university to discover the sculpture in 3D reconstruction. For the first time, Leonardo da Vinci's face appears in three dimensions, giving it an uncanny realistic feel. It was surprising that they were so uh, similar. That also confirms that artistic approach uh, is not something of just a fantasy, but uh, it is uh, uh, quite well compared to that of scientific and numerical. This is the first reconstruction of this kind on da Vinci's face. You could say we were able to see what Leonardo looked like, as though we recognized him if we ran into him in the street. But there was a problem matching the 3D reconstruction to the Lucan portrait. Of course, the first thing we did was superimpose Leonardo da Vinci's reconstructed face onto the painting. And we got chills at that very moment, because the images did not correspond perfectly. When we looked to match the face at the level of the nose and mouth, we realized that the eyes did not fit. So we thought we had made a mistake, a reconstruction mistake. We had missed something. But what? To answer this question, we must explore how self-portraits are made. Self-portraits first appeared in Florence during the 15th century. Initially, the painter would put himself into a painting, into a crowd scene, as a kind of, um, I think, a memento that he was the one that painted it. It was almost like a signature that he was putting in. And he often makes eye contact with the viewer. In his fresco in the Brancacci Chapel of the Carmine Church, the artist Masaccio appeared as the last figure to the right of the Circle of Apostles, wearing a blue hat and dressed in red. Florentine artist Filippo Lippi represented himself in his altarpiece dedicated to the coronation of the Virgin. He is kneeling to the left, looking outward with his head resting on his hand. One of the most significant is undoubtedly that of Sandro Botticelli, Leonardo's good friend, who appeared in his famous painting, The Adoration of the Magi. The second phase, then, is where the painter begins depicting himself in a portrait itself, where it's actually a self-portrait and standing directly before us and showing us his likeness. Um, and that's a very different sort of thing, because if you think who in the course of the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s got their portraits painted, 
very important people. Popes, cardinals, very wealthy wool merchants. And so it's very significant when suddenly painters step out of the background and into, into literally the canvas, into the frame, and begin depicting themselves. And so we have someone like Albrecht Dürer, the great German painter and printmaker, Dürer deciding that he was going to represent himself, that he is important enough to show his features in a painting where there is no one else. I think it's saying, I want to be remembered. I'm important enough that future generations need to know what I look like.